For those of you that find this broadcast across the multidimensional time stream, thank you for joining us once again. Welcome back to Remember Your Mission, or as other people call it, the multidimensional trailer park, also known as the School of Multidimensional Intuition on YouTube. For those of you guys that follow our, our work, you may have noticed over the past year or the past few months that every now and then we've been bringing new people on and doing some what I like to call pre-recorded conversational interviews. Something a little bit different than the semi-regular kind of bizarre, absurdist live stream format that we have, which I do greatly enjoy. But every now and then we like to go a little bit deeper and talk to some new people um, and just kind of, you know, venture, venture deeper into the realm of energy, our human experience, what makes us tick, why we do what we do, and really kind of understanding who we are in this earthly realm. For those of you guys that may or may not already know, my website is rememberyourmission.com. And part of the reason for that is because understanding my mission and my, you know, kind of soul's journey, who I am and what I came here to be during this human journey has been one of the most paramount and absolutely transformational experiences within this human journey. And so over the past few years, I've encountered a few people in, you know, different areas, conferences, events, sessions, you know, all sorts of settings. And um, one of the things we we decided to do over time was start to bring people in from our community and just kind of go deeper, look into the deeper areas of their life, understand what makes them tick, and also what do they have to offer? Because one of the things that I've noticed about the current alignment of our multidimensional soul group, meaning those of you that follow this work and are a part of the larger community of kind of activating or awakening beings that kind of follow the overall milieu that we're involved in there's a lot of really incredible people within that group within that soul group that don't always get seen they don't always get heard they come into these bodies with incredible experiences incredible gifts incredible talents incredible abilities and one of the things that i've noticed about the current temperature in our soul group is there's a lot of hero worship of falsity false light and just all kinds of you know strange distorted energies and as a result of you know the exaltation of those strange distorted negative energies many of the real ones many of the authentic ones many of the ones who are actually doing the work behind the scenes often become unseen and unheard and so one of the one of the purposes i believe that we have with this channel is to bring those voices out and to talk to people that i believe in you know my point of view those that i have encountered in you know our earthly realm and along the way bringing those people in that i think have a lot to offer and so um one of those people is definitely drago reed a person that i think i first came in contact with i want to say about three years ago in the year 2020 or maybe shortly thereafter when i was doing some you know what we might call pivotal work some transformational work kind of calling out certain liars and making a big stink on the secret space program scene there was a lot of drama there was a lot of changes and for some of you guys that know there was a whole channel and a series of videos that we put out and in that crazy upheaval in that crazy stage there was a number of individuals that kind of stepped forward and made themselves known into my timeline and one of those people is the person that we have in front of us here today Drago Reed and so what I've noticed is over the past few years we've been having kind of a a one-sided conversation where every now and then he would send me like a supportive message or tell me about himself or to honestly make honest connects to, you know, honest attempts to connect and kind of, you know, create an alliance of sorts and kind of me in my own world going on my own strange path. You know, I would, I would take notice of such things and see those things. And what I've noticed is that over time, our paths have drawn closer and closer together. And I realized that we were kind of running in the same circles, believing many of the same things, interacting with many of the same energies, witnessing the same levels of distortion and idiocracy that had taken over this kind of huge soul group and you know over time and you know watching some of the work that he's done and kind of getting to know him on a little bit of a deeper level i feel that there is no more fitting person to bring into the school of multi-dimensional intuition other than drago reed and so a little bit earlier this year um I, I guess we almost crossed paths in the physical realm. I was at a, 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 a you know a wonderful conference in Los Angeles, California called the Conscious Life Expo, which I will be real for me it was chaos and drama. It was a very difficult event, but you know within that process, I remember there there was this one night where I was standing there taking taking pictures of the crowd, and you know lo and behold, like a week or so later, I received a picture in my Facebook messenger and it was just me <laughs> and my wife standing on a staircase with a camera and I remember looking at it going what the hell what who is this guy what what is he doing he was out there stalking me taking pictures of me he didn't even introduce himself and I remember going like 
what the hell, who are these people, you know? And um, lo and behold, it ended up just that picture alone opened up a whole kind of series of dialogue. And months and months later, we find ourselves in this very moment right now um, with many identical understandings, feelings, beliefs, opinions, viewpoints on the nature of energy, how we're interacting with it, the timelines that are coalescing and being created, and really just this, this, this process of awakening and understanding who we are together in this human realm. And so I'm very honored to have a discussion with Drago Reed here today. I'm going to read a little bit of his bio here, guys. And so for those of you guys that know me, you'll probably know, you've, you've probably noticed over the, you know, the past, you know, year or so of doing these interviews that I'm not a person that really necessarily reads people's bios. I don't even ever read my own, but this is an individual that comes to us with an incredible level of knowledge, of learning, of ability. And I guess our mission here today is get to know Drago Reed on a little bit of a deeper level. So I'm going to read through some of that information here. And Drago Reed is a Dolores Cannon Level 2 QHHT Quantum Healing Hypnosis Technique Past Life Regressionist. Less than 5% of all hypnotists in the world possess this knowledge and skill set. Through this technique, he is able to take the average everyday person into the sonambulistic state of trance, the deepest level of an altered state that exists within the human mind through simple visualizations and colors to obtain unlimited amounts of information to the client. The technique is also used to heal physical pain, injuries, drug use, emotional issues, disease, cancer, to recover memories and deal with countless other inflictions permanently often in a single session. Drago is a polymath, an adept researcher, and a deep dive investigator with over two decades of study in the fields of ufology, astrobiology, exobiology, exopolitics, consciousness, quantum physics, quantum mechanics. You guys, the list goes on, and it is wildly, wildly impressive. And so we're going to let him talk a lot more about his experience in those areas, but due to a major motorcycle accident in 2005 from crashing violently into a wall at 120 miles per hour, Drago had a near-death experience and an out-of-body experience, breaking numerous bones, suffering substantial brain damage to the parietal and occipital lobes of his brain, including his reticular activation system, the visual processing center of the brain, inadvertently rewiring his neurons, giving him unexpected side effects. What kind of side effects, you might ask? Well, he developed numerous cognitive upgrades, including a dramatic boost in IQ, claircognizance, precognition, high probability prediction as he can process numerous scenarios in a one hundredth of a second. And so we're, we're, we're dealing with a person here who has incredible mental capability. And so um, I find his knowledge highly, highly interesting, highly, highly fascinating. He has the ability to see concepts as Nikola Tesla did in his mind and how things can be built or be created in their most rudimentary and functional form using the least amount of parts. He can reverse engineer technology and tell you how to improve a product with less steps involved or create an idea for a product that's never been utilized and constantly thinks of inventions. He comes from a family a, or a military family with a famous invention patent. He's a world traveler visiting 18 countries over the last decade, spreading and collecting knowledge visiting ancient sites to find the truth about answers to the universe. He is also a full-time tattoo artist and body piercer of 22 years working in Tampa, Florida. His website is fractaloflight.com. He also does, I believe, a, a regular show with uh, Laura Eisenhower over on Rumble, as I understand. I believe that's called Rebel Collective. Am I right, Dick? Uh, Drago? Right. That's Excellent. Correct. So you got... You guys can check out Rebel Collective on Rumble as well. But um, anyway, thank you for showing up. Um, we had an amazing conversation before we started. Hopefully, we're going to return to some of that. And, um, you know, like I said, we've been kind of crossing paths over the past few years in a strange way. I have a tendency to, you know, I keep the whole world 10 feet away from me most of the time. And Drago is one of the few people that was able to kind of crack that shield to get in there. And so I have I have great admiration for your energy. And anyway, now that I've rambled on and on, and hopefully I didn't massacre your bio. How's it going? Thank you for being here. Yeah. I think I like you because me and you are really similar and stuff like that. And like the things, like you said, we've been into, we're starting to talk about these things and we have a lot of uh, the same viewpoints about stuff. 
and like it's just all coalescing together and it's all kind of filling in puzzle pieces and making more yeah. sense and like it opens up so many freaking conversations like totally. me and matthew are probably going to talk about 150 threads per like 20 minutes maybe so, <laughs> it's probably be like full tail boogie full yeah. steep head right now yeah it, it, if you can start out by giving us a little bit of some history i noticed in your bio and also kind of in some of the other other interviews you've done and you know also talking with laura on on uh, her show or your guys' show that uh your near-death experiences and kind of the accident and the stuff that it looks like at least from a limited perspective maybe that that kind of set you on the path to what you're doing now but as as we get started, for those that have never seen you or or uh, heard you, tell us a little bit about what happened, how did it go down, and how did you get to where you are right now? And just so you know, I'll probably interrupt you with a lot of questions. I tend uh, to do that, but yeah, take us through like the early days. How did this whole thing get started for you? To start with the early days, let me just tell the audience that I have no memories from birth to age ten. I would say maybe Leah, maybe I have. I think of Kabbalah maybe around 20, 25, mm, that's pushing it. Maybe under 20 memories up till 10 years old. When I hit that wall, I basically lost my childhood. At that time, I didn't realize that at the moment. And I didn't think about my childhood for a long time. And then it got to the point years later, I started to think about my childhood. I'm like, where did my childhood go? Yeah. Like, I damn, I feel like I have a damn near photographic memory from anything after 10 years old. Like me and my mom would always have these talks and we would have these random memories. I'm like, Hey mom, remember this one thing that happened? And she was like, how do you remember that stuff? I'm like, hmm. I don't know, you know? And then fast forward to now hitting that wall really messed me up. Um, did all kinds of stuff, broke a lot of bones, really messed up my head, but it also gave me these Cognitive upgrades, but also like dyslexia. So like I, I have trouble with small words, like very small human words. That's what I like to refer to it because like you want to talk about complex theories, anything but mathematics, I'm your guy. Quantum <laughs> physics, quantum mathematics, let's go down that route. Just don't have me have to do some math because like that bump on my head, I don't do math. I don't either. Oh, and I never even got bumped on my head. I, the only I, thing I need to do is how it count money. That's it. Okay, there you go. Maybe before, that's all you need to know how to do, right? Yeah, but um, my first my first death experience was around 13. I ended up drowning in the Guadalupe River. And uh, I remember stepping out of my body, seeing my little 13-year-old self just do backflips. I basically went off this two-foot drop. I'm talking about literally two feet, man. A waterfall drop, two feet. Wow. And when I went, I had leaned back. Apparently you're not supposed to do that. So like when I fell, I started oscillating backwards, doing backflips. Eventually it knocked me unconscious. Eventually I took a drink of water. Were you underwater at this time when you were flipping? So by the time I said that, I didn't talk about this for the longest time. Like I only started talking about this not even a month ago, man. My whole freaking life, I kept this to myself. Yeah. Like. I'm a very private person. I have been my whole life. I've been, I've been alone a lot my whole life. So I've raised myself pretty much. And I've learned a lot myself, read a lot of books. And the only person I can count on in my life was me because father was never there. He left when I was like nine or 10 years old. Yeah. So I've raised myself and Everything I wear, every place I ever went to this day was because of my hard work and my studying and my sweat, blood and tears to do that. And it's been a, it's been a long journey. Yeah. So back to the drowning part, I remember looking down at my body and you, I remember you can see myself like going doing backflips. And I remember I couldn't do nothing. I'm just moving my arms. And I remember I would hit the little bedrock every every time I do a full revolution the back of my head would hit that 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 stone Ooh. and it would kind of like almost concuss me it would make it would like i'm still holding my breath but every time i spin around it hit me again and it would just over and over it would just hit me to the point where i i, I couldn't do nothing and i'm stepped out of my body i'm looking down <clears throat> eventually i get back to my body and i realize after i came up from that water that no one noticed i'm with my family at the time 
no one really noticed. So imagine a little fat kid that was made fun of almost his, I'm going to say my whole life. I was talking about, I was a fat kid up till about 19 years old, 20, right? I was always that lonely fat kid. I was always the friend, you know. All right, right. Mm -hmm. So that taught me to read because I was always alone. So that's how I got that deep dive into books. And that started way early, like sixth grade obsession. That's kind of a cool story. But um, get back to my body. Years later, I had the bike crash. That's a 25. I was uh, going way too fast on a motorcycle. There was an 18 roller on the right side of me in the middle lane. And I seen a an exit coming that uh, that came a little too fast because I was obviously, you know, it was only 80 or 90. So I had two choices, either put it in the third gear, go around the semi, take that exit, go home, or hit my brakes, let the 18 wheeler pass me, probably miss the exit. I chose the latter. So I came in, I remember put that thing in third gear, I do a little mini willy, I get down, I end up doing 160 to get to that exit. Nice. By the time I seen that exit, I realized not at the time, retrospectively, it was only rated at 35 miles an hour. You know how sharp a turn is if it's only rated at 35? Yep. Okay. I come in 120. Now, unbeknownst to me at the time, the city had snaked the concrete to prepare it for a new concrete. You know where they dig those yep. little yeah, yeah, the little, yeah. If you've ever rode a motorcycle, when you hit it, you, you it's just like, Bup, 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 bup. Yeah, your, your steering wheel is shaken. So I hit that doing at least 120. I remember looking down at my speedometer, I'm doing 120. I start to lean the bike, violent shaking. I realize that thing is coming so fast, that turn is coming so fast, there's no way in hell that I'm going to survive this turn. Keep in mind, my friends are following me. Oh, okay. I stayed the night at a friend's house in the middle of the country. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. So 45 minutes away is the country. And at that time, I didn't have a fancy cell phone with GPS coordinates and telling me turn by turn. I had to print out a map quest to get there. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. So they were, I was following them originally to get home. I seen that exit 160. I took that turn. They went around behind the semi to watch it. And I remember at that moment, I knew I was going to die. Period. At that point, they watched me take my hands off my steering wheel. I closed my eyes and put my hands up in the, in the Jesus pose. And I just said, relax. And wow. then I remember the bike started just going like this. And I remember going, whew, thrown like a rag doll at 120 miles an hour. And I remember, I don't remember much when I was <laughs> spinning through the air, but I remember coming down and hitting the concrete because the entire left side of my body felt broke and not mm -hmm. only did i hit the concrete i also hit the guardrail mm -hmm. first i landed in the guardrail left side this is yeah. seven breaks here seven pieces can't see it in this light but it's sticking out three quarters of an inch yeah so i i broke all these bones went to the hospital long story short years go by I have another crash. I crashed my Honda S2000, my drift car. And uh -huh. some, some jerk off hit me out of nowhere. Wasn't my fault. I was doing 35 miles an hour in traffic. Hmm. Someone reverses into traffic from the other lane across at a 45 degree angle into my car. So at that point, I remember my, it was pretty hardcore the wind it hit me like the violence because that was a accumulation of about 75 to 80 miles an hour of hitting a dead stop wall with both of our speeds. Wow. So I spent, and I remember hitting my head, my, my window was up, and the little S2000, it's a two-seater, so your left arm is literally on the window frame, and then the glass is touching the actual, your flesh. Yeah, yeah. So I remember at that impact, my head and my elbow go through the window, and right when it hits my head, pop, I started seeing it in slow motion. I seen little fragments of like uh, particle dust, the just go everywhere and I, I remember thinking I'm counter staring while looking around in fast motion and making decisions and by the time it stops it's just like <laughs> then it goes real time and I'm like holy crap and when it happened I wasn't even shocked because I've already processed what had happened 
And wow. the adrenaline was already wearing off because all within that moment, I processed all that time. Yeah. And it basically never went away. So when I can, some of these upgrades it gives me is I can, I'm, it's almost like Bane. You're, you're like a, a tactician. You can see all these scenarios, but mix that with Dr. Strange. Like when he's sitting there meditating, you're like, your eyes are fluttering. You're like, and like, you see all these scenarios. And like, I, t- I like to tell people I like to use Occam's razor. Mm. And Occam's razor chooses the most logical scenario. And I would say 99.9%, mm, 98.9%, I am right. Yeah. Like, I can predict car crashes because I see the variables and the impossibilities of movement and how it's going to hit certain parts. Like, it's crazy. I, I have a question about that, though. What was the stage or talk a little bit about what that was like when you were coming out of these injuries or after these accidents and you kind of realized that something was different about your consciousness or that maybe, you know, after, you know, recovering somewhat from these injuries that you, you know, you noticed that maybe your sensory system was different or like the mental body had changed or, you know, as you talk about how some of those skills came on, which are very evident in your energy field, if I can add, a lot of people will come in, I I guess, as doing what I do on a professional level, which I'll say this for everyone watching, when people say professional these days, it means nothing because you can do ayahuasca on Friday and by Monday, you're, you know, a galactic shaman based on our current universal standards. So, you know, professionalism means nothing, but as a person who kind of looks at energy and looks at the energy of individuals on a regular basis, there is what I would call a, a, a very, very unique energetic kind of system that you're working with. And anyway, having having said that, tell us a little bit about when when you noticed that there, after these things, that there was something very different about you. Because um, I think you could also agree, you know, this is a good thing that, you know, the manner in which you show up, your presentation, your your energy, your vocal style, even your name itself is all very, it's very, very unique, highly, highly unique. And so when, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. When did you notice things got weird and maybe more psychic, we can say? Man, I would say it would be more situational. I'd be presented with a situation and then bam, <clears throat> I could figure out the situation or I would see things other people couldn't see. Kind of like you just did an interview where the, the certified type of therapist was talking about how the brain can do certain things and we're surrounded by certain bits of information. So with the reticular activation system of the brain, that brain it processes around 1 million bits of process of, of 1 million bits of, pro- of information at any given moment. And the brain can only out of 1 billion of, uh, sorry, 1 million bits of information, the brain can only process 128 bit out of it. So the average human brain walking through life, you're literally using like a super Nintendo worth of processing power for a brain that has the ca- capability to see a million bits of information, 360 around you. Even though we can both agree that, this is all an illusion. We're mm-hmm. both not literally sitting in a chair looking into this mysterious Zoom video capturing this essence of us because it's all a creation of our own mind. Yeah. Even the things behind us, like they don't, they're not even here. It's all it's all in the mind. Absolutely. Now it's got lost. Okay, oh, one caveat yeah. I want to tell the obvi- audience is yeah, my brain damage is if I start loading a situation and start talking, I can lose my train of thought easily. I do too. It's okay. It's okay. I do it every day. So no worries. We'll just, (laughs) just remind me and it'll be like, I will stop. Like I didn't start. start I I was asking about how, how, and how, and when you noticed that after your injuries, there was, there was abilities underneath because you know, that that's a factor for a lot of us in this life near uh, death experiences, catastrophic accidents, traumatic brain injuries, PTSD, uh, all sorts of traumas that, as you know, you know, and everyone else that's watching, um, they will open the door, yes, for many wounds and things to recover from on the physical plane, but they're also gateways. They're gateways to higher levels of consciousness, what, you know, they call them the law of one catalyst, catalyst for extreme growth and activation. And yeah, when, at what stage did you realize this, there's some ability underneath all this trauma? How did that get uncovered? All right, I've been trying to figure this out for a long time. I've been trying to pinpoint a singular moment in my life, like the catalyst, the moment. Yeah. And I can't recall the moment, but I know things changed when I realized I started seeing it in slow motion. Yeah. So basically, the average person sees about 24 frames per second. When you're watching, like, 
live broadcasts, sports stuff, that's about 30 frames per yeah. second, right? Fast paced actions done in 60 and then 120. Anything that fast, the average human brain with the reticular activation system cannot process that many bits of information. Therefore, it's all blurry. With me, you can put me in a situation and I can see everything. Kind of like when I seen you at Conscious Life Expo. I wasn't even looking your way. I just seen some energy coming from over here and I felt just, I felt like a cool energy coming from this the way of the staircase. And I just happened to glance over because it was almost like a ping of energy. Nice. Like across the quantum field. It was just like I was seeing you were experiencing something telepathically before I actually got to see it. And in that moment, I'm like, you know what, man? I don't know how many shows I've done where no one ever takes photos of me. And it's offensive. I would love for people to take photos of me because like Same I want to remember those moments and like being remember the conversations I was in yeah. that I didn't even know were actually cataloged by somebody. It's just like, dude, thank mm -hmm. you. I didn't take a photo that moment and you just made my day. Thank you. So that's cool. So when I sent you that message and it, it got kind of funky for a second. <laughs> I was, I was in like attack mode after that, dude, we got, I'll just, I'll just say this publicly. I, I really, really don't care. We, we got shit on by so many people at conscious life expo. I mean, directly, directly to your face, to your face, people that were bitter and hateful you know just toward whatever i was doing and I, I i think a part of it was you know the temperature there had changed you know they were in a stage of extreme portrayal of literal false light kind of spirituality and i was stuck in between you know the 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 uh, it's one of the secret space program fakers and you know i think who was it the princess of the pleiades <laughs> uh, you know like on the other side or something like that it was just it was it was it was just like a a a haven for extreme spiritual posturing and just absolute false light nonsense and so i was on you know not that i was under attack it was just like whoa huh, we definitely don't fit here anyway you know what i mean one of those moments but anyway go ahead go on i believe it came with the great purge and what i mean by the purge i mean that some of the most strongest speakers in ufology and consciousness were literally blacklisted yeah at conscious life expo and contact in the desert and i had to do my own investigating on that and it went pretty deep because uh, the blacklist affected a lot of people I know, including Laura. And I had to contact the direct owners to figure it out. And I'm like, what's going on with this ban? Like, what's, you know, why is there a ban? Why is no one, why is all these people getting uninvited to all these shows? Yeah. Like, you recently did a roundtable with Laura and you all discussed about how a lot of the, I don't want to name people at this moment. We're only going to call them the gatekeepers, right? Yeah, yeah. Gatekeepers, they're, they're blast, they're blacklisting everybody. They're uninviting them to the shows. They're, they're, they're making public smear campaign videos. Like if you are of the love and the light that you preach in your books and everything you say in your videos, but you're the antithesis of all that information, kind of like Corey Good, mm -hmm. right? When you see him on that deposition, that dude is damn near borderline vicious and mm -hmm. there's so many words i would like to say like he pissed he's pissed off a lot of people since that deposition leaked man mm -hmm. like uh me and laura just interviewed leon kennedy and you started that entire project man and i was telling you early before the show that you were the primer and catalyst to a movement that people needed to see happen because we were tired of being lied to we're tired of conscious deceivers we're tired of all these fake SS people coming out using memories that aren't even theirs. And then mm -hmm. you find out they were in the forums and they were in the groups and they were there behind the scenes. And when they tell the story, you can tell the conscious deceivers from the authentic people because most of the authentic people, even though they do have memory call over a time, their story typically never changes. They say the same words, the same sentences. They describe it in the same way Let's use David Wilcock, for example. He repeats himself a lot. True. He likes to talk about himself a lot. So we can understand. I, I was a huge David Wilcock fan since probably I was, <laughs> 2012, yeah. since before Wisdom Teachings, man. Like, I have his books over here that he freaking signed to me right over there. <clears throat> nice. So when I started seeing these videos come out and all these accusations, what's going on behind the scenes. And I started hearing undercover recordings of mm -hmm. Corey and David talk. 
in what they were saying about the movement and how they were calling their own movement. I remember hearing Corey and David talk behind the scenes at Contact in the Desert. Someone was recording them when they were behind the uh, the main stage, and they were talking about. Corey said, "I can't believe anybody believes in these blue chickens," and Corey said that himself, his own words, and they they were just laughing it off, talking shit about all this. Yeah. So, you know, I, I watched Cosmic Disclosure since the beginning, and I would tell everybody, spend some freaking money. Go to guide.com, watch this freaking testimony because the shit that Corey Gord was saying, it was dovetailing off all the information I was hearing about from actual other people in the forums, in the groups yeah. behind the scenes. Because this is before Corey Good, I would say he's like the star of the movement. He was a necessary evil totally. to bring awareness to the secret space program. Like Corey says, he invented the world space program but i've heard that other insiders have used that word for at least 20 years going back yeah i think michael ralph was talking about it in like the late 80s or something wasn't he or maybe it wasn't the, that exact term but something and like sometimes. the interplanetary corporate conglomerate i swear to god it is either in the movie 2001 the space odyssey or it is in aliens part two oh, and it? It was either Nostromo was working for the interplanetary corporate conglomerate, or it was the two. I've been trying to figure it out lately because I remember seeing that after watching the movie again, and I remember seeing the ICC in this movie. I'm like, wait a minute. I remember Corey said he made that term up. And I'm like, hold on. This movie's been out since like the freaking 80s, man. Like, hell no. Hold on. He said he invented the word Anshar. <clears throat> I'm like, okay, that's not possible because the Anshar is the direct descendants of the Anunnaki. The way the genealogy goes, it starts with Tiamat and Apsu. They mm -hmm. combine energies, create Mumu, their vizier. They three combine their energies and they create Lamu and Lahamu, then Anshar and Kishar. And then from Anshar and Kishar comes Anu and Antu and the Anunnaki kids, Enkian and Lil, Thoth, mm -hmm. Marduk, all of them. Yeah. All the Egyptian pharaohs we was talking about, and that connects directly to John King Lackland of England yeah. and all the presidents of the United States. So unfortunately, this entire planet is all Anunnaki structure. And that's some fascinating stuff, man. I study that stuff pretty heavily. Can I ask a really basic question about that? And this is su super, super basic. It's more of an opinion question because... You hear a lot of people as as we are coming into greater awareness of, you know, even the term Anunnaki, you know, and I mean, there's there, there's there has been some controversy over what it actually means. And what I've what I've encountered, at least, you know, whether it be through channelers or other people or, you know, experiencers or researchers, most people that I've talked to um, reference the Anunnaki as being this, you know, all pervasive, pervasive, negative force of energy. That there are these negative beings, these kind of slave keepers of 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 mankind. Can you comment on that a little bit? Do you see them as that? Because when I feel into that essence of those beings or those energies or what we might call kind of like a social memory complex frequency now, at least that's how it shows up for me, um, that it feels like, you know, it's definitely not entirely negative, but very, very deeply polarized in, in many ways. But what do you feel about that? Is, an, is Anunnaki inherently evil? What are your views? All right, so there, I think maybe the crux of your question is you have all these groups saying where the Anunnaki, what the Anunnaki word is. Is that yeah, what you that they're, that they're bad, that they're evil. Okay, you know, I that like the basic low level, like, oh, that's Anunnaki. That means it's instantly bad. Kind of how everything that's Draco or reptilian is, you know, now evil automatically. And granted, a lot, you know, a lot of it's very intense and, you know, inhospitable and fundamentally incompatible with humans, but I would not call it evil by any stretch. But yeah, what are your, what are your views? Is that, are these negative beings positive? What do you think? I would respond with, in the beginning, let's talk about Genesis. Yeah, yeah, go for it. All right, so in, in Genesis, it says, let's make man in our image, in our likeness, right? Who's God talking to? We were taught that God is singular and the word Elohim is singular. Turns out that was a mistranslation. Elohim is plural. 
So in that line, it says, let's make man in our image, in our likeness. Again, if we were taught monotheistic God, are you talking to an alternative self? What's going on? Why are you talking to yourself like that? Okay, it makes no sense. If you go back 4,000 years, you read stuff like the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Atrahasis, you find out that Genesis is a summer as a summary form from Sumerian tablets. And then you find out that three beings are talking at that moment, and their names are Enki, Enlil, and their sister and Nenhursag. And at that moment, they were talking about making a being where they mix their DNA with a current humanoid that already lives on the planet. That was part of other programs that predated the Anunnaki. So you can imagine human-like people, hominids, human-like, like I said, and I would say around 200,000 years ago, as you see this gene edit, you start seeing that we have caps on telomeres and like mm -hmm. suddenly we had this longer age and then it was cut down to 70 years. You can see it in the human genome mapping project. You can see that our DNA was altered and it's not possible to do that. It's, 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 it's akin to having two ropes that are infinite and then you sever those ropes yeah. and then you put a cap on each rope. And then that's completely severed. That is not how it works. All DNA strands, they don't just cut themselves off and have caps put on, right? So you find out that they wanted to make a worker race because they came originally to their planet. This is what all the Sumerian tablets talks about. The oldest writing we ever found. This is, this is like Sumerian etching. This is pre-hieroglyphs in Egypt. This is some amazing stuff and we found out that the stories say depending on i don't care what source you say that we all everybody agrees generally what the stories are but details changed but basically the anunnaki lived on this planet they they went through this warring eternally over family structures it was a, a, a war of kingship basically mm -hmm. brothers fighting over brothers nephews trying to kill uncles to take over kingship and it was just like eternal wars. And it eventually involved nuclear war and it started affecting their, their ozone. And this is what the Sumerian tablets literally talk about. It describes this. And they had figured out that the planet that they lived on, it had extreme volcanism, lots of volcano activity. And the activity that would put up in the atmosphere would actually block off the ozone and allow them to live. So it got to the point where they went through so much nuclear war that it made all the males sterile. A side effect of that is it made them master geneticists. So pre-Earth, the beings that came to Earth, and you could find that our DNA is directly connected to them starting around, I would say around 200,000 years ago. So mm -hmm. that's some pretty big stuff, man. But eventually, the Bible talks about it. All the all the major epics, all the major uh, religious books, they all talk about the same stuff. Then you find out, like the Bible, for example, you have Yahweh. Yahweh's older name pre-Bible is Enlil. Mm -hmm. okay? It's the same guy. He was the vengeful guy. He said, murder all the men and children. When you get into town, take the women as slaves and like have sex with the children and take them as tribute and kill everybody else if you want to like sacrifice your firstborn like that's in lil so mm -hmm. when you say are the anunnaki good or bad that's a tough question i would say would you consider a species that invades another planet that comes in mixes their dna with something makes them their slaves and then they eventually create a monetary system and a controlling structure through language, mathematics, astronomy, agriculture, animal husbandry. It all came from the Anunnaki. All of it. Everything. And all that ties in to Hitler's obsession with the, the, the Vril Society and the Tola Society and why Maria Ors Orsich uh, was channeling the Babylonian. They were literally speaking in Babylonian when she yeah. was when she was channeling the Aldebarans uh, of the Aldebarans, you got to realize the Anunnaki had outposts in Aldebaran, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't mean you're talking to Aldebaranians, whatever you want to call them. Aldebaran. That were in Aldebaran? 
Yeah, so it doesn't mean that that's who they are. Like with the Orion Wars, everybody split to different planets. These refugees went to Mars. Earth technically wasn't here yet. It was first Mars and Mars was a moon of Tiamat. Yeah. And when Tiamat exploded, Mars lost its atmosphere and a chunk of Tiamat settled in the second position. Yep. So that asteroid belt contained Ceres. Ceres was a moon of Tiamat. It got caught inside the asteroid belt. I didn't know that. I, and the I, asteroid belt is loaded with freaking gold. The Anunnaki call it the hammered bracelet. And it is full of gold. But the problem is the Anunnaki could never cross the hammered bracelet and never get past it. So they can never see past Jupiter. Because they, every they, ship that they send through, the asteroid belt would kill all of them in their ships. They talk about this in the Sumerian tablets. So they One they still can't cross that. Sorry to interrupt. Are they are they still like unable to cross that barrier? No, they mastered that a long time ago, man. Yeah. Okay, like yeah. long time ago. So the original story started with the Anunnaki. There was this king named Alalu, and he was banished during a fight with Anu. So he leaves the planet in banishment, and he starts seeing the planets, and he has a name for each one, and it also happens to do with all the all the main gods. They yeah. all have the same names going back. So he talks about and he describes planet to planet. He comes upon this small planet, Pluto. He goes to the next planet. He describes it, the watery planet. It's mostly water, blah, blah, blah. And he goes planet to planet in the Sumerian tablets talking about he finally finds Earth. But before he found Earth, before I started too, talking too much about the Anunnaki, I would this like to really have a conversation good. versus me talk the whole damn time. This you is know, actually I'm, really I'm, good. I, I do have another yeah. question, but if you want to follow up on that. <laughs> okay, so basically, I'm with Alalu, you. Alalu, he actually left. This is what the Sumerian tablets say. Like, I don't care if it's Zachariah Sitchin. Most of my material comes from Stephanie Daly. Okay. I'm talking about original seriologists and like George yeah. Smith, the original guy. So like, Zachariah Sitchens would get a lot of his interpretations from George Smith because George Smith was the first guy that cracked the language. And yeah. I believe that was a soul contract. You don't just random. We found out through QHHT, like none of this shit's random. Yeah. Like the things you're obsessed with, like if you're obsessed with certain planets or certain scenarios, odds are you live those lives and you're remembering them on a soul level. So like that's you pulling to it, you're gravitating with it. Like no matter what people do, it cannot push you away. You're going to just get closer and closer. You have to discover everything. But anyways, when King Alalu left as part of that banishment, he stole one of the big spacecraft. And with that spacecraft, he stole something called the weapons of terror. Those were nuclear bombs. They used the nuclear bombs on their own planet to kickstart volcanoes to produce more ozone protection. So King Alalu brought these weapons of terror to the, to the hammered bracelet. That's what they call it in their history and all their epics and tells. It was always called the hammered bracelet because that happened in their ancient past. So he figures out that he can use these weapons of terror, these nukes to get by a certain part of this asteroid belt. He actually breaks through the first Anunnaki ever. Mm. He gets to Earth, he figures out that he, he literally says that his ship scanned the atmospheres and says it's compatible with his own planet breathing. So his own planet had oxygen O2. Yeah. Takes off his mass, walks out of his ship, breathes the air. He walks upon a river. He sees that there's fish in the river. He starts walking through the little terrain and there's mountains and stuff. And he sees that there's fruits. So at that point, he knew. He knew that he, if he comes back to, to, to Nibiru, and he tells people that they found another planet where they can survive their own deluge and their own catastrophes and they can have somewhere better to live. Alalu went back. Yeah. He went back. Another battle happened. Eventually, Enki came, Enlil, Anu came. And that's how the story starts. Yeah. So, really quick, tying the Bible with Yahweh, it was Angel Gabriel that was sent to start the entire Muslim religion. It was, he told Muhammad, Muhammad was an illiterate. He forced Muhammad to read and write his diktats, which came from a Christian angel, Gabriel. Interesting. 
Gabriel started other religions as well. Go down that rabbit hole. That'll trip you out. That's so you, you not, find I, I out that. I have not heard that. That's fascinating. So the bad, bad guy of the Anunnaki would be in Lil. He's basically known as Odin. Right, so, right. So like Thor and Loki, mm -hmm. that would be that would be like a uh, Marduk and Mar maybe maybe Nergal. Mm -hmm. That's Nergal. He started some crap back in around 2000 BC and before that that involved nuclear war. Like let's the Sinai Peninsula. If you look at the Sinai Peninsula from satellite views, you can yeah. see that the whole thing has been blackened. And in in the Sumerian tablets, they talk about that this war had happened. And they unleashed the weapons of terror. They were not supposed to have done this. This was against the wills. And they did it anyways. And Enki allowed it to happen. This was his own son. Enki told him. This involved the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it wasn't to, to kill off the homosexuals and the immoral people. It was way more than that. Like, they, the Sumerian tablets literally say that they nuked spaceports in the Sinai Peninsula. Like, literally spaceports. Yeah including the story of the Tower of Babel. Yeah. Humans were mimicking the gods, the Anunnaki, and when Enlil came back from his shar, 3,160 years, that's how each rotation is. It's called a shar. Mm -hmm. So each shar, they're one year old to us. So every 3,160 years, they're only one year old. And keep in mind, the age of Aquarius is now. That is the new age. So all these people that said this new age movement, humbo jumbo, listen, man, the new age means we're in, our, we're in the procession of the equinox. So we're entering a new age, which is 2,164 years, right? So we start the new age. We go from Pisces into Aquarius. Aquarius is the symbol of Enki. Oh, I, I have a question about that. And So that's where the return of Enki is coming from. Without go. going down that rabbit hole, question. without going down that rabbit hole, that's oh, not... like the premise. Okay. That's the we talked about that. That's the premise. So the return of Enki is literally shown on the constellation. When they when they say th those those 2164 years, those are like years of kingship. That's their role. Like we just got out of Marduk's role. Yeah. So that's what they do. They come in. A certain amount of years and it all has to do with the procession of the equinox 25,920 years and at the midpoint we have all these cataclysms around the world you'll see that every time we have a major flood now there were other things that happened in the past there were numerous floods everybody always wants to talk about a single freaking flood there's like, a lot more than that yeah yeah i agree look at, look at plate subduction look how many times that the continent has tumbled upon each other numerous times and you see that in antarctica where it's two yeah. continents kissing yeah see that a whole continent is actually in the west is not part of antarctica and it's smashed into it creating this mountain range that's what it's yeah i've also heard that interesting i absolutely yeah yeah so without well well i'll just ask because you know it's a big thing and we don't we don't have to get anybody's names or any of that stuff but what do you what are your viewpoints on the 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 current you know kind of spiritual disclosure ufology elitists talking about the second coming of Enki. Enki's back and he's doing this or he's doing that or I don't know maybe he's maybe he's saving us. Like what do you what do you think about that? I don't believe that at all. Why? I don't believe that Enki is coming back to return grow DNA. Enki is the sole reason why we lost it. He was the one that took it away from us 200,000 years ago with the last genetic edit that was done to us. So if you ask yourself, go down this rabbit hole, <clears throat> why would somebody return something they stole to make a slave race just to make it whole again? Why, what is the motivation to do that? Yeah. If you only have two-strand DNA and we originally had 12, do you know what that would do to your codons, to your neurons, to the energetic field and the astral field and all the other levels that compromise the human body, the astral body, all that stuff? It yeah. would explode with energy and awareness. At that point, we would know the truth because odds are we would be connected to the Akashic Records and we would know everything about us. We would know our past, present, and future lives simultaneously at the moment of thought. Isn't that kind of happening, though, already in its own organic unfoldment way? Yes. It seems, it seems to me that it is. I'm not saying it has anything to do with Enki, but I'm like, it seems as though we are having a collective activation and a remembrance of those things and... 
I guess, you know, maybe for me, the, the question comes in, and maybe this is just me trying to angle it in a different way, but it just feels like to me, the current talk or the, 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 you know, the pseudo spiritual influencers that need to continue to create some sort of clickbait every week. So that we're like, Oh, something, something's happening. It just, it feels like a social construct that they're using to gain cloud and some form of supremacy over information dissemination. Like it's just a, like a buzzword that they're throwing out there without any kind of deeper knowledge of it. And maybe I'm totally wrong, but it, like, what do you think about that? Are you talking about how they're interjecting chaos amongst the population and making us go at each other's throats and separating us from, from left and right, up and down, like male, female, everything's inverted? Is that what you kind of mean? Actually, honestly, no, but you're bringing into it an area of it that is also equally viable and applies to that question. Because I have, I have noticed that, at least from my perspective, and maybe this is me putting labels on a thing, we are we are knee deep, maybe neck. We're 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 neck deep in what I call the age of reversal and the uncovering of hidden knowledge. And um, just like you said, everything becomes inverted. Every single truth gets inverted. It's not this; it's the opposite of it. You know, it's like that that whole game, which you know, to me, I, you know, through my work goes to a number of different channels that you know don't have that have very little to do with Anunnaki and more what I call like reversal technology and I get more anatomical with my understanding so I think that just helps me understand it more but um I have I have seen a lot of that I have witnessed a lot of kind of the unpacking and the collective kind of cognitive dissonance around the understanding of those things and you know, I guess kind of the question which we're going to move on from was that I've just seen that it's been a distorted talking point that people use to gain cloud or to force you to buy into a certain timeline. And um, I guess with that, get ready, I'm going to take a hard right turn. Here we go. We're going to take a hard right turn. Um, what's your viewpoint on the Vril, whether as a source of energy, a group of beings, a what we might call a race, what we might call the coming race, if you follow, you know, uh, the literature, because at least for me and the work that I do and kind of viewing people's energy and kind of working with stuff that's going on and what we might call the astral, which is always a cringe buzzword nowadays, but um, there's a lot of real energy available. And I think that it's a naturally occurring wavelength of energy that uh, has been given kind of a distorted name by our consciousness. But can you just comment a little bit upon your understanding of what real represents? Because there's so much folklore and craziness around it that, you know, to me, I don't think it's all correct, but what's your viewpoints? I would say that the Vril Society and the Tola Society, the Tola, mm -hmm. they both found out that there are these beings that claim that they live inside the planet. Mm -hmm. And they were claiming to say that they were, they were from another planet. In order for operational security reasons, you don't want to tell someone you're actually located near if you make them believe you're far away, that's how you control something. If they know you're right next to them or under them or even in their vicinity, it'll freak people out, especially if it would be like an alien versus a human. Yeah. So de depending on how deep the real conversation goes, I would say I know a decent amount. And yeah. I knew it was because of Maria Orsich and the Vril that we found the reverse engineered Vimanas in the Himalayas. And then that's what Hitler took to base his entire secret space program, his entire space program, Corey Good, space program. So that's where the Daigalaka comes from. And that's where the Hanabu comes from. It was from reverse engineered Vimanas. Yeah. But what, what, the, what, they, what they did not tell the Maria Orsich and Hitler was that these Hanabu produced a ton of radiation and ended up killing all the operators all yeah. of them yeah. over time or very close to the beginning. But um, that's where the whole regen tanks came from. It was the Nazis inventing this regeneration technology due to the advanced radiation levels of their pilots being poisoned. So they started, this is where the folklore gets really deep. And this is where the entire Marvel series goes. And it shows how Hitler was obsessed with the occult and he was connected to these extraterrestrials in real life. This is not folklore. This is a fact. Mm -hmm. And he was taken all around the planet. You can see it in Hellboy. You can see it in all these movies, Indiana Jones and the 
Ark of, the Ark of the Covenant one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And the cool thing about that movie was, man, like when the bad guy Nazi, when he came across the Ark of the Covenant to do the ceremony to open it up, he was wearing the exact breastplate that was described in the Bible and the Sumerian tablets and the exact crystals that were described was in that chest plate. It turns out George Lucas wrote all those movies. Yeah. Steven Spielberg directed it. Most people don't know that he was basically an insider with the government and he was given all this classified information in order to put it in people's consciousness what was really going on and then you cloak it in science fiction. So yeah. it's, it's a way to tell the public the truth, but also say, hey, none of this is real. So we don't expect you to ever believe it no matter what, period. Yeah. We're going to show you Star Trek Next Generation, aliens interacting with humans on a bridge in the Federation. It turns out Federation's a real thing. Oh yeah, you know what I'm saying it's just like they actually—it's actually called the Federation. There's so it's also like, a lot of like manipulation around like the the concept of the federations and the alliances and the what is it the the Council of Light and you know I anytime I'll admit anytime someone starts talking about federations and councils now I get a little like hmm, really but I know I I absolutely believe there are many many real ones I also know that. All you have to do is get a couple of people together and suddenly now we're the alliance of this. And it's like, yes, you are. And it's like, it could be instantaneous. And so I think it's also a social construct, but I might've took that comment and twisted it into a weird direction just by saying that, but. I'm a weird direction kind of person. So that's oh, cool. good. <laughs> Cause I'm going to make another weird, weird kind of direction turn here as well. Um, at the risk of going on and on about that, which we're going to, we will definitely talk about more in the future. I would like to kind of turn a corner and maybe bring it back to a little bit more about you and kind of one of, one of the things that you and I have been talking about over the past few days and um, and that is your experiences as a QHHT practitioner um, because um, I I have I I I I have noticed and talked with many people that have just incredible experiences through what they discover in in those healing sessions and having not been through a QHHT session in my own right yet at least um I was wondering if you could kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about your experience in that how did you get started in it um how are you using it now and just anything else that you feel is important I would say that it all ties back to all my traumatic crashes you keep in mind we had that stuff happen at 13 and 25 the crash right and then mm -hmm. years later I had the s2000 crash which is you know the head through the windshield so it's been one event after another and then mix seeing ufos in the skies for the first time to 23 with people standing next to me verifying i'm actually seeing stuff in the sky and it's literally I remember telling it to move a certain direction and it would move a certain direction. So at that point, I realized that consciousness traversed time and space at the age of 23 and that telepathy is real. And at that moment, I don't know if I got a, an upgrade or something, but I started co connecting people. I started seeing more things. And then the thing at 25 happened. And then I started seeing even deeper and deeper. And then it got to the point where I seen so much pain around the planet that I wanted to see more pain. I wanted to see the depths of the human soul. I started watching death videos, people getting their heads cut off, people killing animals. Like I wanted to know what the most depraved individuals will do. Mm -hmm. Totally. To do that at a young age, I mean, I started doing that probably around 18. And like, it got to the point where you see what humanity is capable of. And it takes a strong mind to be able to watch stuff like that and not close your eyes. You know, it's kind of like, I'm so connected to all life, all life period, a single ant. I remember <clears throat> I was sweeping my floor in my plant room and I caught the ant and apparently I may have broke its spine. And I remember feeling so much remorse. I got down on my knees asking forgiveness because I know that that ant is me in another life, having another experience. And there only is one mind in this universe. And I literally tucked my fingers to its antenna and I said, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I thought about that ant every single day. So yeah. that's how much I've connected to life because if if suddenly now it's to the point if I see an animal about to die, it's almost like I remember the Mad Max movie, Witness. Yeah. Instead yeah. of looking away, mm -hmm. watch it happen and be there with that consciousness in that moment. 
and don't be scared to look away, man, because yeah. if we can't even face what's in our, if we can't even face watching an animal die, because I don't know how many times people have stories of watching their animal run down across the road and it gets hit by a car and then it dies. But when it, right when it happened, they looked away yeah. because they couldn't take what was about to happen. It takes a strong soul to not look away, yeah. to bear witness to that person or that moment. Because I've watched people die since mm -hmm. a young kid. Like I've had a lot of people die of lung cancer in my family. And to watch people turn into skeletons and rot away, it's pretty hardcore. Yeah. I agree. So I've, I've been around car crashes my whole life. I'm always the guy that's arriving on scene to help someone that is dying. And I always have a med bag. I always have a trauma kit, nice. you know? Nice. always i always keep cayenne pepper with me and it's organic in case i see someone bleeding to death mm -hmm. because cayenne pepper can neutralize a gunshot wound within 60 seconds sure can. you can swallow it or you can stuff it in the wound but guess what people it's not going to burn because capsaicin is only receptors on your yeah. tongue so nice. put it in your open wounds don't worry about it it'll just clot That's oh yeah so yeah, I'm a trauma freaking magnet, man. So yeah, all throughout my life, tattooing, for example, people come to me suffering from extreme traumas and I'm there for them. Why they tell me that story, why they lost someone, how they lost someone, someone that lost a child, a miscarriage, lost a, a wife or child. Like it doesn't matter going through an abusive relationship. I'm the person that's been there for 22 years straight with these people deeper than a barber, man. Wow. It's like you think barbers know stuff. No, tattooers know the deepest, the deepest secrets of your freaking soul. Because with a barber, you might spend a couple hours with. With a tattooer, you can spend months out of a year getting tattooed. I'm talking about ten hours a day, every single session. What do you think we're going to talk about for ten hours, man? We're probably going to get to know each other pretty damn well. So over time, I realized through all my own traumas of my own upbringing that I always knew what to say to people because I went through a lot of the similar things. So it wasn't like I'm talking like a psychologist where it's like, yes, I understand what you're going through. What you need to do is this because psychology says, you know, I'm mm -hmm. not that guy. Yeah. I'm there literally connecting with you because I see you in myself. The, what you're going through now, I remember when it happened to me. So it got to the point where I just know how to console people and know to say the right things because I genuinely care and I genuinely connect with people. And it's not from this disassociated kind of step back kind of view and very yeah. clinical and very it's observative. And like, I'm writing shit down about you. It's not even like that. So just mixing that all together, me being closer to consciousness and over time, it, get, it gets deeper and deeper every year. Like I can see the connection, everything be seen in slow motion. You can see how everything re interacts. Oh yeah, I, can I just ask a question about that really quick? Because you were you were talking about like the seeing like the you know hundreds of frames per second, and maybe this is a dumb question, but does that would that mean that you kind of see other things in kind of slow motion on a regular basis? Is that like a normal thing for you, or is it something that you will kind of focus in on and then like perceive that? How does that how does that work in your perceptual field? Okay, so since you just said that to me, now I just focused on your entire body. Now I'm looking at your breathing, your little ticks, the way there's, there's many point, of them. <laughs> at this point, I've already established a baseline talking to you, like subconsciously. So yeah. anything out of that baseline, anything that's abnormal out of that, it automatically flags me immediately and I focus on it. I can see a change in your breathing. If I say something that you really like, I can, or if I say something incriminative or something you completely disagree with, yeah. you could bring your hands up here, you might kind of. You, you might try to censor yourself or you'll breathe, you'll, you'll, you'll swallow and you'll see it come down the throat mm -hmm. or you'll see the breathing pattern changes. I see all that with everybody and I can't turn it off. Now, if I really want to focus on it and I bring that awareness to it, I can really, really hone in on it. So mm -hmm. for example, I said this in a recent interview where I can be in like a restaurant <laughs> and what it did, it, these upgrades, it jacked up everything. Imagine all your senses turned fucking up mm -hmm. and it's always on up yeah uh yeah, okay definitely. so <laughs> i can be in a restaurant and right. i can hear everybody talking and all the chatter and then i can just hear one conversation i can look across and i can hear like jabble right mm -hmm. i can focus on i can look 
and then I can shift. It's almost like a frequency. And then I can look away and I can almost hear the damn conversation from across the far distance. And I've realized like I hear farther away than I do up close. I don't know. That's weird. It's kind of have like farsightedness and nearsightedness, but my mm -hmm. hearing, I hear extra low frequencies, extra high frequencies, like resonant ringing where you can have a some kind of emf field and it'll have a ringing sound and i can hear it like it does something to my field of energy like it's it's kind of like when i read people you're sending me all this energetically and when i'm talking to a client when i'm in a pre-interview before we're going to do a hypnosis session kind of get to know you yeah who is matthew morning and what has your struggles been what are you working on the most in life that you're not actually succeeding? Like, what are your setbacks? Why? So we figure all that out. And then we just get all that shit answered. Right now, I'm just losing my train of thought again. Oh, no, that's okay. I guess I'll, it's no worries because I, I literally do it all day, every day. But what was it that made you go, I'm going to do QHHT? When you were like, you know, I realize I'm, or, you know, because a lot of us come to the stage in the awakening journey where you will choose to integrate a version of yourself oftentimes past lives, future lives, parallel lives, it's irrelevant, but there's versions of us that are already acting and kind of living a life as these, these, these beings or the other version of you that's practicing QHHT in other realms. What, what was it that pulled that experience in for you in this life and this version of Drago? Because it feels like you've been doing this lifetime after lifetime. And so, you know, at the risk of over asking the question, what was the thing that made you go QHHT is my modality, or at least the starting point? It was pretty interesting you said that. Um, my awakening, my moment was Dolores Cannon. And I was the guy where I'd be scrolling through Facebook or Instagram and this woman, this older woman with the perm would keep coming up in my feed. And <laughs> my own stereotypes, I would just scroll past her, right? Mm -hmm. And then suddenly this woman kept coming over and over. So I click on a video one day and she started talking about consciousness and all this other stuff and she's a hypnotherapist this past life regression i'm like very interesting so scroll along her stuff keeps popping up and i'm like why does this woman keep popping up so i started going down that rabbit hole i started seeing what qhht was long story short we're from the same soul group we basically we are we came here to start an awakening and it involves stages and it had to been done in stages because you can't start an awakening all at once you have to prep the consciousness decade by decade over time because you have to load energetically into the blueprint of the DNA and the consciousness. One thing that MK Ultra studies find out is that humans pass the trauma genetically to their offspring. And they originally found this out with the monarch butterfly, but humans do it too. And this is something that's not talked about. And this is why Anybody in the MK Ultra groups that's in like stuff like you would consider the Illuminati, mm -hmm. a lot of these people were identified pre-birth yep. because their parents more than likely were identified to suffer from schizophrenia, disassociative identity disorder, stuff like that. And that's the people they look for. They look for genetics of disassociation. Yeah. So Hitler's obsession with the Aryans you found out that the Nordics, the tall whites, the blonde haired people, those people go back to Lyra, one of the first existences that ever happened. That was the obsession with the Aryans. Mm. And they were the easiest to program because they had the original codes before it was pre-altered by the, by the Anunnaki. Yeah. So they were looking for the direct descendants of them. Yeah. So you'll see in Hollywood, there's a bunch of blonde haired, blue eyed people and red haired, red haired specifically, and they'll always dye their hair. And you can only like I notice this subtly. Yeah. A lot of these famous actors, a lot of them are redhead, blue eyes. And that's the original archetype of the Larens, the original true first human corporeal form that ever existed in this part of the galaxy ever was Lyra. And that's where all this obsession comes from till today, because all of our governments, they run some form of trauma-based mind control program. All the military structures, all the boot camps, it's all trauma-based mind programming. All of our school systems, trauma-based mind programming. 
roles, bells, times, penalties, yeah. corp corporal punishment. It's all the same stuff. Yeah. All of our jobs, it's all set up for the same structure over and over and over. We are a literal prison planet, man. But anyways, it was Dolores Cannon. And I remember figuring out what QHHT was. And I'm like, this is what I'm born for. Yeah. Something told me that I was really good at this before I knew that I had did this in past lives. So when you said this earlier, you seem like you're the guy that did it in past lives. You're right. And the last life I remember doing it was the Temple of Horus. It's also called the Temple of Vedfu in Aswan in Egypt. I think it's uh, southwest of the Giza Plateau. And um, I was a bloodline born priest. And one of my main gifts due to my genealogy connected directly to the Anunnaki at, with that exact bloodline was I could peek into your soul. I could read your past lives. I can see all the lives you've ever lived. And I can also see the distortions in your body of your chakras. I could physically see them with my own eyes. Yeah, because definitely. at that time, we had the inversion of the divine feminine. Mm -hmm. when, when the kingship came to the planet, before that, it was worship of the feminine. And the Anunnaki, they had destroyed their women. It was yeah. all men. Men are superior. It was all patriarchal. So any religion based on a patriarchal God is all Anunnaki based, period. It's mm -hmm. not matter where it came from. It said these beings say they were from this planet. It doesn't matter. They were all in the same wars, fighting the same people over and over again. So everybody gets caught with semantics. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I hear him. I hear him. What's wild is there was another question I was going to immediately follow that up with, and then I got lost, which I, it happens, happens to me all the time where I'm like, me too, man. And I'm then the it, guy who likes to talk about a thousand, a thousand subjects, and you're like, the, the oh, no, people, I love it. They're honestly. like, no, no, I wish you would have talked more about this, or like, what was this about? That was cool. And you're like, holy crap, this verified that, and like, you just connected yeah. these two subjects. No, I, I I totally feel you. And I already have a feeling we're going to be doing more of these anyway. So we're going to get been trying to tell you that shit for years, man. You actually have been. I will say that. I will admit that publicly. You have been telling me this for years. And in the you just <laughs> gave me a chance. No, recently. For real. Now, now true, you're blown though. away. You're like, what the fuck was I thinking, man? Like, we should have done this a long time ago. Yeah, honestly. But you know what? That That's also me and that like that that's. Having having been through honestly like like you probably many many difficult crossroads and events involving social conditioning and the manner in which we kind of relate and connect with each other it's been traumatic and very difficult for me and I've said this a million times but I I had no idea this was what I was going to do in this life I did not have any clue until right around uh, age 38, 39 years old. And so when I came shooting into this, it came in with all kinds of like crazy emotional baggage and all kinds of trauma that I've, I'm blessed to have been able to do lots of work on it. But I am like a lot of people in this kind of, you know, soul group where, you know, it's, it's very, very hard. I am definitely like an open and closed book at the same time. And so, um, but I, you know, definitely we have done this before in other lives and i guess i'll just say another thing see doesn't I, it feel like we kind of know each other already no absolutely well i i have a feeling because you were you were just talking about this this e egyptian timeline thing and that is one kind of area that i've i could say there was a period where i was very obsessed with kind of looking back and kind of looking into what i called past lives and you know like you i think i had a number of experiences that opened up these kind of well literally seals and gateways within the body that allow you to perceive those wavelengths of information on a much more deliberate level. And when I started engaging with those energies, um, right around 2016, I started to just, you know, kind of view and see these other versions of me that at the time, I didn't know it was a version of me, honestly, until I got married uh, to my wife now, and she has much, much more ability in that area. And she was able to piece a lot of it back together for me in ways that I instantly knew were true, because it was like the missing pieces that I didn't have before. And one of the things that I was doing in those Egyptian timelines, maybe this is how we knew each other, is that, you know, I was one of those people that was weighing the organs 
and like getting people ready to pass into another realm and literally taking apart, reconstructing and deconstructing their bodies on an astral and a physical level. And it's weird because I look back on those timelines and there were stages in that journey where there was great upheaval and an overturning of control structures and people were leaving the planet in droves and also leaving their bodies in droves. And there was literal lines, like thousand people long, physical lines of people coming to see people like us over and over and over again. And it was very difficult. It ruined a lot of our lives. It literally ruined us. I'm, I'm sorry, what? They would come for healing a lot. Oh, of yeah. Ab, ab, we ab, were literally suffering and we were the only people who had the magical gifts to do it because we knew yes. the science. And, and it was... And it was only and it was only passed down directly from the Anunnaki because, like again, the pharaohs are the direct descendants of the Anunnaki. They are the yeah. fathers. So everything we ever learned all goes back to the Anunnaki. So like Giorgio Sukalos, he always says aliens. I'm like Anunnaki. And funny, the word An or Anu means heaven. So there's this argument where they say Anunnaki is this universal term where all aliens are Anunnaki because it said. Uh, the people from uh, i forgot what the terminology is uh those from heaven come to earth or whatever right, right, right. heaven was the name of of anu that was the direct meaning of his name so that was being very specific to the anunnaki and people when they say that all beings that they can call themselves anunnaki that is incorrect they are not with that original group period so you cannot just colloquial just throw them in that group and say they're all this they're all this one entity that is incorrect i have an awkward question i'm just going to throw it in there do you do you or to me it feels like you have a lot of anunnaki frequency within your soul within your essence almost like you know you're you're literally one of those beings and i mean that in a in a respectful way not in a like you're this anunnaki being but what do you think about that because like the way in which you talk about it the level of knowledge like i i can see the level to which you've sat there and like you know worked with and like unpacked and studied these things and researched the concepts and the origins the many different viewpoints do you feel as though that's a big part of your kind of soul's history and incarnation cycle hopefully that question makes sense <laughs> i have definitely been anunnaki more than likely i've rh negative blood i just got a blood test i'm about to take it oh so yeah i don't, I don't know if mean. i'm if i'm directly rh negative and that i wouldn't be shocked if i was I've never really known my blood type. Me either. I still don't. I have no idea. Like I'm one of those at home blood tests. So I'm like, I'm about yeah. to open that package up and see. But uh, I've been showing. I don't want to know for some reason. Dude, you should. You need to. I feel like I'm a mud test. blood. You know what I mean? Not that that's the right use of that term, but I feel like I have just like some total commoner, like you know, diluted bloodline, and that I'm kind of more of an anomaly that I maybe I made some agreements or contracts, and they're like, you're just a regular shitty mortal, but in this lifetime, you might do something cool for five minutes. That's kind of how I see myself. I think it's purely human, but um, but RH, who knows? Maybe you know, maybe you are. I also see you, and and you know, maybe 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 this is because I I, I hope this is not embarrassing. I mean this, you know, respectfully. But a lot of people that I've found that have been linked to me or people that I have had resonance with, um, very, very reptilian in nature. And, you know, one might look at you and go, well, his name, well, I mean, his name's Drago. So Every, Drago. everybody always say I can go Drago? to any of those shows. Yeah, every yeah. show I go to, they're like, you are a reptilian. I'm like, I know. Like, you can tell because I barely blink. No, you could see it in your eyes for real, for real, literally, mm. literally. You could see it in your eyes for me. Hey, without it, freaking it, out the audience, I've been shown lives that I was an alpha drag general as well. Mm. So I've been on both sides. And in in order for anybody to understand this, is I originally come from something called the Golden Phoenix Fire. And that's some that's a very high hierarchical structure. And basically we create the universes and the roles and governing structures of those planets. It goes back to pre-Atlantis, it goes as far back as to, I mean, this was, this was pre-Earth. Yeah. And a lot of the wars we had before we memorialized time and time stamped it and started having written records because it was before all that, it was all like what you consider digital. Everything was stored on crystals. Yep. Marian tablets literally say that 
the yeah. Atlantic stories literally say everything was stored on crystals. Everything. This is why your cell phone, your your watch, mm -hmm. your ring, all the technology has crystals in it. How do crystals know the time-space continuum of time? Think about that. It's a good question. I don't know. How? How do they? Do you know? It's more of a metaphorical question. <laughs> okay. I feel you. Yeah, yeah. So in QHHT, we found out that crystals are the base creation of energy. So you've been a crystal more than likely first. We found about this, the structure of the law of one. First density, crystals. Mm -hmm. Primordial elements, earth, fire, wind, and water. And you got to realize I've also been a wind being. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Wind is a being. It's not a creation of a catalyst of moments that create wind. Like, imagine when wind is hitting you, it's going through your entire body. It's not just hitting you and going around you. It's going through the particles. It is its own entity. And I told this in another interview that basically the job of wind is to create change. And without wind, stagnation occurs. And this comes from my life of the Golden Phoenix fire structure. Yeah. I was involved in a catastrophic, very I can't even find that singular word that can sum All it up. Right. Part of that Draco life. And the Draco life I did have, it was part of an agreement between me and another being. We wanted to incarnate on both sides because no one was winning this war. And we had to create a catalyst in order for something to happen. And we both came down from the Golden Phoenix fire. He incarnated as an Arcturian, I incarnated as a general. I specifically was a general alpha drac. And if you know about those things, those things can kill a human within 60 seconds, no, 15 minutes of being in their energetic field. Totally, just, just, just with their eyes alone. No, 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 just their energy. Well, yeah, like, that as well, but. You have know. you seen me walk through the crowd at these events in my, in my armor? Actually, no. <laughs> you no. will, man. It is. I have it, say it, it is intimidating as hell. Like I just interviewed Suzanne Spooner, yeah. and I wore my super soldier costume. I wore at Contact in the Desert. Nice. And when I interviewed her, I said, "Do you remember me being at that show?" And uh, I didn't want to tell her what my costume was. I wanted to see if she genuinely actually remembered. And she remembered me being a soldier, and she said, "And intimidated the crap out of everybody." I'm like, "Hell yeah." But when I put that mask on, man, it's like something from the other lives kicks in. And it's just like I open my eyes for the first time. And when I walk through that crowd, time slows down. And you can observe this. I shit you not, man. This is a real phenomenon. Yeah. yeah. I will walk through that crowd, even me as a human. People will split. They will see me and energetically they will move and you'll feel it. But when I'm in that costume, man, people just, their eyes get huge and they just smile. And that's one of the biggest compliments you can ever have. And people, they just, when their eyes get that freaking huge and they just get taken back and the conversation freaking stops, you can walk into a bar yeah. and the whole freaking bar stops. I've done it before. And like, I've shown you some of the costumes I have. Imagine me wearing- It's wildly impressive, by the way. We're going to talk about that in a minute too. But anyway, go ahead. But it just imagine me wearing some of these costumes and it's like, it's so out of context, but like the, that brown and black super soldier armor I wore to contact the desert, that's the truest reflection of who I am. Nice. And when that, like I said, when that mask goes on, I become who I am between lives. Oh, I like, okay. I like that. The With real my genealogy of QHHT, I've been shown that I've been a soldier in numerous lives and I've been in this internal war that's been going on for millions of years. Yeah, and I've had to I've had to incarnate in certain bloodlines in order to get information and to destroy shit and to just do different random things. Cool event was something that happened in twelve thirteen called the Magna Carta. That was an interesting event. Whole other story, whole other, whole other time, but that would explain my extreme obsession with law and the Constitution. And oh, okay, okay. I studied law for a long time, man. I was always that kid that nice. I was get taken advantage by the cops, getting pulled over and getting a gun pulled on you simply for simply having black tent. So it taught me the law, man. Mm. And then I just really went down that rabbit hole and I studied stuff as far back. I actually found out that all of our modern law, the 
the Uniform Commercial Code. It's all based on canon and ecclesiastic law combined. And then you take canon and ecclesiastic law and you go back to the Code of Hammurabi, hmm. which is directly from the Anunnaki. All those rules, all those Egyptian rules and Persian rules where they say an eye for an eye, you steal, you get your hand cut off, stuff like that. Those are crazy those to are see that all of our laws based that far back and it's derived damn near word for word or the structure of it goes that far back interesting so a lot of my conversations just doves tells right back to the freaking anunnaki it's okay i'm actually i'm i'm greatly enjoying it i'm gonna create a diversionary question here and this is more of an opinion based thing and um I'd like to get your comments on this. I've said this before publicly, and some people get a little bit hurt when I say it, but I often cringe when people talk about, you know, extraterrestrial beings and the host of, you know, hierarchies and councils that they're working with. And, you know, you'll ask somebody, you know, and granted, we're all star seeds, even though that's a cringe term for me, I pray to God we'll find a new one. It feels like flower children in the 60s. And anyway, having said all that, you know, you ask people like, well, where are you from? Where's your where's your soul essence? What what star races are you from? And for some reason, those of us in this spiritual community, even though you know we consider ourselves you know so you know highly connected to this host of beings it seems as though we can only ever name about five or six of them right you're either pleiadian or you're arcturian or you're syrian or you're you know uh reptilian you know orion and it's like people are stuck in this five flavor spectrum of extraterrestrial energies what are your viewpoints on that? Why do you think that is? Um, does it mean anything? Is it just me kind of nitpicking, you know, social tendencies? Like, what are your viewpoints on that? Because I see it as unlimited. And I think a lot of us pigeonhole ourselves mm. and try to create social cloud and like add ourselves to lists and names and create associations based upon stuff that we don't even understand. And, you know, like when I check in on those beings and I work with people's energy and I look at who the hierarchies of beings that are connected to them, there's no names. There's no, hello, I'm an Arcturian. It's like nobody, literally nobody says that. And so anyway, I guess I'm giving an opinion and asking a question at the same time. I do a lot of that, but what are your, what are your views on that? What I like to do with QHHT is I like to fi fin figure out what star system they're from. And then we'll use the human mind and everything the human mind's ever learned to basically make that make sense with the star system. Does that make sense? Because you're, totally. what do you do? You're only use, using the base knowledge of the person you're talking to and all their experiences, unless you're talking to the higher self. But again, everything that person's ever learned, the use of words, for example. Right. Higher self can only use the use of words that you've used and you've that ever you have, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Now it can be more stringent, more serious, or it can be completely comical and joking. Like on me and Laura's show, I'm super serious. I don't get to talk a lot because I interview people for, you know, you don't get to really talk about yourself if you interview people. Yeah. So like this, it's more freestyle. You see, I'm more openly energetic and I'm actually funny as hell. Like me behind the scenes, I'm funny as hell. My timing is freaking immaculate. Imagine with that, imagine with that, mix that with a brain injury and timing and comedy. Yeah. That means funny as hell almost every time. <laughs> I can tell you. Nice, okay. and i have the funniest jokes I, I have these weird will ferrell jokes like dad jokes and they're the funniest and they're all original every time i come up with these original jokes constantly nice. <laughs> it's just it's funny nice kind of yeah. like uh, my bio says i can invent stuff left and right like yeah i, I, I can tell think of a joke funny. and i think of it so fast i play the whole joke in my head and i ask myself was that funny and if it passes the filter of yes it was funny i say the joke out loud Interesting. So you have like a probability filter in there that kind of helps you, you know, in in insert it or kind of throw it out in the right. Yeah. Way. Sometimes the bad joke does come out, and I thought it was maybe due to the lack of understanding of the complexity of the meaning of the joke, yeah. more than likely. But other than that, that's cool. That's cool. There's yeah. There there there's there's like an interesting come come complexity mixed with all kinds of 
I, I'm even see now I'm kind of losing my train of thought complexity yeah, mixed with interesting humorism and kind of just incredible self-confidence which I deeply admire I am one of those people that uh, I will never take my I never take myself that seriously in fact I think it's the most health healthy healthy thing I can do but um, I really love the way you describe yourself and like you know just your abilities I think it's admirable and um and you can you can kind of feel me getting weird. I'll start stuttering after a while, but let's 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 change lanes if we can really quickly. Because one of, one of the things that I enjoyed about kind of talking with you over the last couple of weeks is that um, it turns out you've got all kinds of and you know maybe we were talking about this before we came in. We might call it hoarding, but you you're you're a consummate collector of at least from what I've seen Hollywood memorabilia uh, objects things like tell tell us a little bit about that it sounds deeply impressive okay that's a pretty good question because I've never no one's ever asked me that because nice. you know I don't talk about the things I own openly you know it's a new thing for me to kind of come talk about it so I guess you're maybe the first person that I've talked about it to and kind of showed you what I had and like talking about it on the show so I would say that starts around the age of 16, and I was working at Spirit Halloween. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, this was Spirit Halloween before it was Spirit Halloween and around the United States. Back in the this old when days. the original owner that started, a guy named Trip Snugs, hmm. he was the original owner that started Spirit Halloween. I worked directly with him. And I was obsessed with horror since a kid. And I had all the horror, all the posters up on my on my walls. I had the crow, everything. Bruce nice. Lee's son. I fucking yeah. love Eric Draven, that role and what he did for people and how he would save people's lives. And he would put his own life on the line and get shot and cut up for doing the right thing. It was like, I don't know, it just inspired me to go That's beyond cool. death, to seek love and life, you know. And uh it got to the point where I was really creative and I was asked to create this graveyard scene at Spirit Halloween. So I created this huge graveyard scene paid by them. I didn't make any money off of it. It was just more like, yeah, just a thing. Yeah, to do. It was so such a big deal with what I made that it was on the news and the newspapers. So that, that got the attention of Chris Abrams and Chris Christensen of Los Colinas Movie Studios. And they had came into spirit and asked me if I wanted to work for a new project with them. And they were opening a mall studio movie tour with actual authentic movie props and costumes from the movies. And I'm like, hell yeah, I want to see all these movie costs and costumes and like touch them. So I ended up being part of this tour where I would take people around, tell them about all these things. And we had these original guys that were on the movies came in and we built these full-size props nice. coupled with actual movie props. So I remember being, I remember building a nine foot alien queen and bringing in parts of a helicopter to make it look like it's crashing through a wall with bricks while we have a fucking seven foot predator with the original predator mask. Nice. which by the way is extremely heavy right. i was surprised about how heavy that mask is in real life it is massive yeah and uh i got to wear all these movie props around and i treated them like toys i got to wear michael myers mask um i got to touch all these major props all around the world and it became an obsession nice so i started tattooing it around I would guess around 2001 and over time I started making money because with if you're a good tattooer you actually start making good money so it got to the point where I own my own tattoo shop and I think I own my own tattoo shop within 10 years of tattooing nice maybe seven years that's not common and my shop is still open in Fort Worth Texas it still has the same name it's still there just new what is it called it's called knuckle up tattoo knuckle up tattoo where is it it's in Fort Worth, Texas. Fort it's Worth, completely Texas. different now. It's just the same name, but the direction of who it, what it was and what it is now is not the same thing. Okay. But uh, that shop has been on reality shows. It's been in magazines. I've been on the Discovery Channel. I've been on Pitbulls and Paroles. No one knows any of this. I never talk about some of these shows I've been on. Like, this is the first time publicly I've ever even mentioned it. 
which nice. is crazy for me nice. because yeah. okay. I was living this life where I was making all this money and I was just traveling the world and I was doing all these cool things, building hundred thousand dollar Chevelles and turbocharged cars and BMW M3s and buying Batman costumes and like all these freaking costumes that all these actors wore and like it got to the point where I just became a big nerd. So I got all the toys, I bought all the costumes and it turns out that I feel like I built Michael Keaton's Batman house from 1989. When Vicky Vell walks into that room and there's armors everywhere and it's like I realized each one of those costumes was a reflection of Bruce Wayne's alter ego. Mm. Something in each costume reflected of, of who he was. So in 1989, I remember watching that movie for the first time from a drive-in, and I didn't even get to hear it in audio. My mom took us to watch "Look Who's Talking To," oh, yeah. like Kirstie Alley and shit. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. But I remember watching the damn Batman movie because there was this dude in a costume and he's fighting the Joker. I didn't even know what the Joker was. Right. But I remember watching that movie in the bell tower at the end from the car and just watching Batman. And then I got to see it in person for the first time in the theater and it blew me away. It's cool. Something in me just resonated with it. And the person I was in all these past lives, it's like, I was the Batman, you know, a part of me is Bane because yeah. they both will do what it takes to, to, to really make change in the world. Like Batman, he will put his physical body on the line to help people but he double he does that in an anonymous way where no one knows anything about it and that's what true power is to let no one know who you truly are let them assume who you are but what it comes down to is no one knows anything about you period especially me when i learned 15 years ago that the government was spying on the cell phones on everything i literally started covering up everything my camera like people make fun of me all the time. I have tape covering the front of my camera and the back of my camera. And it's on my laptop covering that. They're like, why do you do that? I used oh to, and then I just gave up. <laughs> well, think about this. Well, think about this, man. No one ever thinks about this. Not only can an average person, an average IT guy hack onto your computer and watch you. He can also watch you watch porn and look you in the eyes mm -hmm. while you're doing it and watch everything you're watching you know what i'm saying oh yeah I believe that is it. beyond so when i realized that no matter where i went everything's spying on me i kind of just did a 180 and i was just like i went into the shadows yeah like i started like walking in the shadows like i started observing things and it's like i never want to be seen because everything's yeah. designed to spy on you and no one a lot of people truly don't know that like when you oh, tell I, people, I believe it yeah like when I seen the WikiLeaks Vault 7 drop, I was mm -hmm. like, I knew about all that. I knew it. I freaking knew it. And they finally publicized it and it vilified everything I've ever learned. And it's just like, I told you, I told you there's cameras in your, in your smart TVs that watch you. They literally admitted it. Mm -hmm. No lawsuits has ever been, no, no lawsuit has ever been gone against WikiLeaks where they challenged the information and lost. Everything WikiLeaks ever dropped was a hundred percent true. Yeah, yeah, they just went after Julian Assange. And do you do you think he's even still alive? Sorry to make a random question throw in there, but is he honestly, even man? I hope he's still alive because yeah. he's one. He's a thread that needs to hold on to help people wake up because what they did to him for freedom of speech and he he literally didn't commit a single crime. I don't know how many times there's been court rulings where they say that even though there's classified information. As long as Julian Assange did not defraud and convince an employee to steal information to then release it on WikiLeaks, then that would only be a crime. Mm. They found out that all the investigations they ever did, all the information was given to him freely. And according to news publishing, even though something is classified, if it is illegal, it can still legally be released to the public. Hmm. It's very good to know. I did not. Know. I mean, that's protected under the freedom of. Uh, sorry, I'm not talking about FOIA requests. I'm talking about the First Amendment, the dissemination right. of information. Okay. So when you're a, a, a news publishing company, you're now subject to certain rules and regulations, and if you violate those rules and regulations, then you're penalized. Yeah, I hear you. 
Well, Julian, wherever you are, I hope, hope he's. I hope he's alive, man. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I totally feel you. Thank you for weaving in and out through many different areas. I do have kind of one other question. I know we've been talking for a while and we're definitely going to do this again. For those of you guys that are watching, we have some plans to do some other stuff in the future. So we're going to be learning a lot more. But one of the things we're seeing upon you know the earth plane right now is the massive explosion of artificial intelligence in many forms. And you know whether you as assign yourself to the belief that it's been ever present throughout our entire human history, or you understand that a lot of people think it's something that we're creating, <laughs> you know, as if we could, um, you know, what are your viewpoints on it? Because some of us out there think, you know, the AI is going to assimilate and take over everyone. And other people are like, oh, well, it's just kind of part of the process. Other people say, well, you know, this is the recreation of the fall of Atlantis and, you know, probably other many other many other epochs as well that have come and gone. But as, as a person that works with QHHT, as a person that, you know, maybe has, or not maybe, has a highly activated energetic sensory system, what are your viewpoints upon kind of the AI timeline that we're all living through right now? From what I've found out through QHHT is that the AI is ancient. And I'm talking about older or older than billions of years old. And yeah. Marion Tablets actually refer to the AI. And basically, the yeah. Anunnaki were using the AI to help them create. And that's what this whole transhumanism movement is. It's basically they're trying to take consciousness and imprison it forever into a computer. So you can never, ever go back to source between lives. So one of the things that the Anunnaki did, they figured out is they knew that the afterlife involved judgment. So they took, it's not like a judgment, like it's more of a self-judgment where you're shown everything you've ever done and you get to see it from the eyes of the beings you wronged and you get to feel right. it, what yep. it felt like. Yep. What they did is they took universal law and what actually happens to us is in what we are. And they took that and made a structure of control. So they became the people, they became the judges. They were the ones taking you through the duat where you would see Mott and you would have the 48 judges and they would basically weigh all the things you've ever done and then they would have your heart cut out. They would put it on Mott's scale and if it was more than a feather, then you would die and then your heart would be given to the, the devourer and he would eat your heart and then that's it. Yep. So the Anunnaki they created cloning because they committed a lot of crimes and this is on numerous planets and they figured out if they died naturally they've got to go back to source and have an account for what they did in life so instead of being judged like inky for example they're just every time they go to pass they transfer their consciousness into a new clone yeah, they, they've talked about this in Sumerian tablets. Thoth mm -hmm. the Atlantan talks about this in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, where he says he will go down into the halls of Amenti. He will lay for a certain amount of time, then he'll come back out rejuvenated. And they talk about all the clones, how they would transfer their consciousness from clone to clone to clone. A lot of people don't talk about this part, where they sit, the reason why they do that is to not be judged. And this is why they place the scarab over the heart upon death, because it's prevent source from appear, appearing in your heart. It's almost like an energetic sigil that prevents you from being judged. So like when you had that job where you would help take the organs. Literally weighing them. They, like they, they did that for a reason because they said that you would return back to that body. They can technically take your organs, take the DNA from it, have your original consciousness transfer it back into a clone body grown by your own DNA from the original organs. Yeah. That's why all the gold, all the wealth was kept in the original human body. Because once the consciousness came back, it wouldn't come back in that body. It would come back in a clone grown body of the original DNA. It would still be King Tut or Akhenaten or Marduk. It's the same consciousness in the same clone body. Yeah. I agree. But earlier to to mention a to to answer a question you mentioned earlier, you said there's only so many species uh, ET uh, species people talk right, about. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay, imagine this analogy. Imagine a single grain of sand on a single beach. 
in a single state on a single planet in the ocean of the cosmos. Now, each grain of sand, imagine that there's no number that can sum up how much life there is throughout the entire cosmos dimensions and densities, right? It's unfathomable. It's an unlimited, infinite number. There is not a number you can put on it. And that's why I refer, they refer to all constellations and star systems as numbers. Mm -hmm. Because there's so many mathematically, we can't figure out, we need, com we need quantum computers to help us figure this out because it's so massive. But I believe that there's been so many stories of warring, kind of like you have the Greeks, the Romans, you have all these pantheons, right? They're all talking about the original same people with different names. Yeah. I mean, does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, like Enki was also known as Apsu, Nudamu, Samael, um, because he was king of Sama. He was known as Poseidon. He was known as Neptune, Oans, and Babylonian. Like, there's all these names. And there was only certain contributor beings that were in these wars on this singular planet. So we've interacted with a ton of beings. But the problem is history, his story, there's only so many his stories between these different groups. So there's only so many contributing groups that can actually even get past and enter this planet because like NASA, for example, we all know is a theatrical agency. And that's why we haven't been back to the moon in forever because I believe Elon Musk, they're just letting the first civilian ever to go to leave the planet, like to not be the military, right? They're letting civilian people, people like Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson. How are all these billionaires now being able to leave the planet? But check this out to sum that connection up real quick. Mm -hmm. I already knew about Elon Musk since the beginning. Yeah. And the reason I know this is because Werner von Braun. He lived, yep, yep. In 1952, he wrote a book called Project Mars. Mm -hmm. In Project Mars, he said that a person named Elon will colonize Mars. Yep. And he will be named as the head of the corporation. And he will do many things. And it turns out, if you study the Illuminati, the word Elon means oak tree. Oak tree is one of the main programming symbols in trauma-based mind control and people in all these groups, the monarch groups, they see the, the oak tree in the programming. That's why you'll see the oak tree in the Norse tells, in the Marvel movies when they talk about Odin and all these people. So you have to realize that like Odin would be Inky, right? No, Odin would be in Lil. He was known as the Thunder God. His weapon was, and actually is, they described it as an, an Egyptian, what's that thing called? It's it's like a double-sided, that's not a furba, I forgot what it's called, but anyways, he was always depicted with that, even in the Chinese mythologies and everything. They're all talking about Enlil. He was the thunder god, and he passed it to his son, which was also known as a thunder god. Yeah. Because Anu was the original holder of it, then he passed it to Enlil, and Lil was the, the thunder god. It's crazy how just all these different civilizations around the world, they're only talking about a handful of people. So maybe we are just working with a certain set of beings that represent themselves over and over and over again in different About time in different bodies, kind of like when Thoth left um, Egypt and the in the the pyramid wars when he was fighting his brother Marduk, um, he was sent to South America and there he was known as Quetzalcoatl, and mm -hmm. he was described as the tall white with the yep. long beard and they are the bearded gods. Yep. Any of the pantheons where they're depicted as curled, bearded gods, anything with horns, those are all Anunnaki. You'll see that the Anunnaki have horns, typically two, three to four horns, and typically that shows the rank. The most common is three horns. Oh, interesting. Even, 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 the, even their sister Ninhursag was depicted as having the same amount of horns because she was equal with the brothers. Very interesting. I have, I have, well, maybe not encountered, but I have viewed very, very vividly sets of beings that kind of sit within, you know, what we might call portals or gateways that do, I believe, part of their, part of their task. And maybe it's the, some of the beings that you're talking about, 
um, very much as you described, maybe they were Anunnaki. I, I'm not one of those people that's like, what's your name? You know, when we're in those states, it's more based on an energy signature, but I've seen a lot of those forms, a lot of those kind of uh, exactly as you're saying, like the rows of, of kind of horns and number of things. And not that I ever try to identify them, it's merely things that I observe, but I think what you're saying makes sense from an observational perspective and um, also from a number of other places. And, you know, once again, your knowledge of, you know, the Anunnaki history, you know, them as a race and their effects and, you know, how they've encountered and worked and, uh, you know, interacted with us on the earth plane is astounding. I look forward to talking about it with you more in the future. Also, the pyramid wars is a thing that I would like to talk about more in the future as well. But as, as you know, we're reaching into the two hour region here and um, for the for everybody in YouTube land, when I do a two hour plus video, they kill it. They just destroy it. Like it's it's suggested to nobody. So <laughs> so we'll 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 kind of start to wind it down from this point. But we can also do a bunch of parts. We certainly can. Who knows? Maybe this will be a two part. I have no idea. I'll probably just <laughs> I'll probably just throw the whole thing. We'll just put the whole thing up there. That's usually how I do it. But. Um, in in going forward, for those that will watch to this stage of our video, how can people take advantage of the work that you do and join you? And you know whether it be QHHT or or the tattoo work that you're doing, or even just like connect with you online. Because I know you're doing the show with Laura. Um, you're you're doing a lot of things that I think. Like I said at the start of our broadcast, which feels maybe it feels like a while ago now, I think that you know probably yourself and myself and a lot of other people are you know we're we're kind of the ones that don't necessarily get seen. We get thrown aside, we get passed up, we get you know in some cases greatly suppressed. We get Let's banned. We're the rebels. We get ostracized. We get canceled. If you're like me, you get you get canceled by a whole soul group of people just for you know saying the truth about people. Um, where can those who are ready to take part in what Drago Reed has to offer our collective find you? I guess we can maybe leave some links in the bio, but my main website is my hypnosis QHHT one, and that is fractaloflight.com. That covers a lot of information and it uh, answers a lot of questions too. If you just read it, it's not as long as you think it is. It's a little, uh, it's a little hefty website, but like it, you'll get through it. Um, I'm the most active on Instagram. That's one, I'm not banned yet on Instagram. Unfortunately, I am banned on YouTube. And I just, I was uh, I was banned on YouTube for about three and a half years and they just let me come back with another account. So let's we'll see how far that goes. But other than that, you can find me on Instagram at space caked. That's the word space with a period in the word caked, C-A-K-E-D. Space caked on Instagram, fractal of light in the internet realm. Um, and then I guess you're doing a it looks the like, Rebel Collective. Yeah. yeah there you go. Um, Laura Eisenhower and I's new show is called The Rebel Collective on Rumble. Please go follow us. It's a brand new show. We were just banned on YouTube. Laura just lost like 120,000 subscribers. And like it was pretty nuts because imagine the royalties off 120,000 subscribers per month. So unfortunately, we're starting all over again, and we're just starting this from the beginning. So your follows and you getting a subscription with Rumble would help a lot. And definitely like and follow us, man. Cool. Rebel Collective over on Rumble as well. And anyway, I want to say thank you for showing up here. Thank you for being one of those people that, and I mean this sincerely, thank you for being one of those people that has been a positive and supportive voice in the background of my human timeline over the past three years. I mean this absolutely, absolutely, because, you know, like all of us, we go through a lot of weird shit in this journey of awakening and activation, many turns, many corners, many, many incredibly twisted webs that we weave along the way. And um, you never really know who's who and what's what until you finally look them in the eye and have a deep conversation. And I think that you're a fascinating being. I look forward to doing more work with you in the future. And uh, for those of you guys that are watching us here, please do check out Drago's work. Look out for him on all these places, uh, you know, throughout the internet realm and do come find us again. We're going to be back in the next couple of weeks, days, who know how, who knows how long my concept of time is horrible. Uh, but you guys can always find us over here on YouTube at remember your mission or the multidimensional trailer park. 
the School of Multidimensional Intuition. Most of those will lead you straight to us. And so in the meantime, thank you for everyone that has watched this broadcast. Thank you to you, Drago, for showing up, for being real, for surviving all these crazy traumas and activations and honestly coming to the stage of your human journey where you're willing to say, this is me, this is who I am, this is what I do. You know, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here, my friend. Thank you for all your kind words and all your awesome questions, man. Cool. We will definitely do this again. In the meantime, everybody stay out of trouble.